Well, hello, and thanks for joining us. It's good to be with you. I'm John Bowles, and I'm the pastor of Becker's Table, and uh, this is Rustin Smith, the pastor of Vox Day. We're sitting at Vox Day, as we have done for the last few weeks, um, and it's uh, always good to be together. And we are happy to have you with us in our conversation, which is really what we're just having is a conversation. We started the current conversation we started last week, which we're calling Words to Build a Life on, kind of riffing on what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that he who hears these words and puts them into practice is like a man who's building his house on a solid ground. And, yeah. and so that's really important for us at this time, this COVID time that we're in. Mm-hmm. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this conversation and that this will lead to more conversation that you can engage with your friends and with your family and with the church. Um, Rustin, I'm just going to start off by asking a real basic question, okay? Mm-hmm. And that is simply, what is the Sermon on the Mount? And uh, the, the, the reason I ask that, it sounds silly to ask. Uh, you go, well, it's this, we find it in Matthew and Luke. And, but yeah. the reason I ask is because, um, let me put it to you this way. When I was younger and, and kind of a young Christian, I, um, I thought... That the, as a kid, that the Sermon on the Mount must have been the one sermon Jesus ever preached. Mm-hmm. Like what happened? Because you've got this one section mm-hmm. of teaching, and it's all this famous teaching of Jesus. And I thought, well, his church must have let him have the pulpit once. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then what they did is they recorded that, you know, all these people are writing down everything that he says in his sermon. Right. And now we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Um, and then when I when I got older, you know, I, I started to realize that Jesus probably taught more than once. Uh, and I mean, besides the parables and stories that he gave, yeah. that he had one direct teaching. But he probably did that more than once. And when as I got older, I thought, well, what probably happened is that Matthew and Luke, in this case, um, recorded a lot of his sayings during his teachings and then kind of spliced them all together mm-hmm. for this uh for and said we'll just make one mm-hmm. one teaching and uh but as i've gotten even older and actually <laughs> studied it some um like you i've started to realize that yeah. there is a little bit more intentionality behind this whole thing yeah. that there's a real reason that both of those gospels yeah. have this section of real direct intentional teaching from mm-hmm. Jesus and um, and I just think it's really fascinating I want to start off with that question what in the world is this I yeah. I'm fascinated by it because um, you said last week that it's really ignored widely ignored and, <laughs> and, and I know what you mean like yeah. it is ignored as far as people actually having intention to do any of it yeah but um, well, we don't know how to do it. I mean, Jesus was, is going to go in here. We're going to find out. He's going to say things like, turn the other cheek. And our reaction is going to be like, that's fine maybe for where you live, Jesus. But where yeah. I live, that's not going to work out. Right. So, right. It, so how, how, application is going to be an issue for us. What does us. he mean and how yeah, do we right. apply yeah. it? Right. Yeah, because I was thinking about that and I thought, you know, I don't think this is ignored. I, it's ignored as far as the practicality, but... yeah. I feel like this, or I think that this is really well known. The oh, Sermon on the Mount, like right. people. I mean, I mean, what's what's more well known that Jesus said? Maybe John three sixteen. Yeah, right. You know, but after that, you probably probably this. his most famous sayings are in this sermon. Yeah, and what we mean by that is yeah. like even if you're not a Christian, yeah, even if you don't go to church, even if you're not a church person, there's a great chance that you're familiar with so much of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a chance, There's a great chance that somewhere in your life, yeah. you have seen a portion of the Sermon on the Mount on somebody's refrigerator. Somewhere on your grandmother's refrigerator. A plaque on the wall. <laughs> you, there, have you have seen this stuff. stuff. Yeah, so yeah. exactly. So uh, yeah. sorry for all the tangent, yeah. but let's go back. What is well, the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, yeah, what you're getting at is you know, something Willard, Dallas Willard said years mm-hmm. ago about we have the same familiarity breeds contempt. I right. think that comes from Aesop's fables or something like that. Mm-hmm. But he said it's actually, it's over-familiarity or familiarity that, that breeds unfamiliarity, which breeds contempt or ignoring right. what he said. It's like, we're, it's it's become such a wallpaper, um, wallpaper familiar to us that we don't even really know how much we know it. 
and therefore we don't know it. And so a lot like a, I start to know my wife so well yeah, that you don't even see her. Did I begin to not know my wife? That's right. Yeah, I mean, it can. That's the kind of thing that can happen. Yeah. 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 So there's so much to say, and I don't, I don't know how how much we want to get into, but even let's just start with what we call it: the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. So it's not on horseback. <laughs> Everything about that needs to be understood. First of all, sermon, it, I've read that this wasn't even called a sermon until like as late as the 16th century. You realize there's nowhere in the actual scriptures that say this is a sermon. That's mm -hmm. something we put on it as a heading in order to understand it. Yeah. So sermon, and what do we mean by sermon? I mean, sermons after the Protestant Reformation are totally different than anything we might think of before that. There's always been preaching and proclamation and... A reflection on scripture and study and uh, but sermons in, in the modern sense it, it, that, that's kind of a modern invention and so that needs to be reckoned with mount and of course last week we joked about this doesn't mean it was delivered from horseback exactly <laughs> yeah as far as we know yeah uh, but what what mountain is Jesus on like I, I've been to Israel and I've been to the place where traditionally this happened that's a real. And, that's a real uh, great arrow to have in your quiver I mean, as a pastor. I've been to no, Israel. I've no, always I'm, wanted to be able to say well, that. I'm super grateful to yeah. have have gone. Yeah. But it's true, and I'd heard this before I went that you can go all over that region and find nothing that looks like a mountain. Mm -hmm. Or in Luke, this whole section is called the, the Sermon on the Plain or the Level Place. Mm -hmm. You can travel all over the region and find nothing that is level. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as well as you're not going to see anything that looks like Colorado. So which so, was it? So a it's not a mountain or a level, or a level place. place, which brings up like why did they, why do they call it a mountain or level? You know, why? Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons for that is, and the sermon begins this way: that Jesus went up on a mountain and sat down. Yeah. Right. Well, mountains in Scripture mean something. Yeah. Um, we've just come through in our daily office readings the the readings about Mount Sinai. That's just one of the mountains in the Old Testament. You could do, this would be worth going into a study on your own. Uh, but mountains in Scripture are always a place of revelation. You think of Elijah or Moses or anytime somebody goes up on a mountain, something happens. Yeah, that's right. It's a word from God or an acti the activity of God is rich. Yeah. So there's no doubt when Matthew is putting this together, He's having Jesus go up on a mountain. It's not that Jesus didn't go up on a mountain, but it's, yeah. uh, I mean, what mountain? Anyway, That's really good. It's a hillside. What he's saying is, this is, something's happening here that is akin to what happened when Moses went up the mountain. Mm -hmm. So if Moses goes up the mountain and he brings down the law, the Ten Commandments, the instruction of God of how to, how to live well, then Maybe he's setting up Jesus here as going up on a mountain and bringing down a word that is going to be something on the level of what Moses yeah. brought. As they would say in seminary, Jesus is becoming a Moses type. Yeah. He's, he's going up and he's, he's, right. he's doing the, the Moses role of bringing perhaps a new law. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to cut you off. So. No, I... I think that's right, and I, Jesus does this a lot, and that's yeah. it's worth understanding. He does it not only with Moses, but he he does it with Isaiah. It, he goes in in Luke four, you know, and mm -hmm. opens the scroll. He reads from Isaiah, and he's talking about, uh, you know, the Lord has anointed me to go and proclaim this good news to the poor, to the blind, to the, those left out, which is all all has bearing on this. So so he's lighting himself up as being kind of a a new prophet, a new kind of Isaiah, and. That has a bearing on this because when we're asking questions like what is the Sermon on the Mount, we're asking who is Jesus talking to? Well, in Luke 4, Jesus tells us who he's brought this message to, to those who've been left out. He's, he's defining his target audience, that's more or less. in a way, right? Yeah. And I always think of that as, you know, I'm a musician, so I know that when, uh, you know, when Elvis Costello puts on a gold lame blazer, mm -hmm that he's setting himself up as a new kind of Elvis Presley. <laughs> you know, if you, uh, in the music business, if you want to put on a performance and somebody comes out and paints a lightning bolt on their face, I know that they're trying to evoke David Bowie. <laughs> it's so true. I'm right? trying to, I, I'm right now, I'm trying to think of more recent examples that like yeah. more relevant. You see yeah. that all the time in, yeah. in that business, but Jesus did that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. he, he said and did things that, 
were evocative of heroes of the faith. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt that in Matthew's mind, Jesus here is the new Elvis. Yeah. He's the new Moses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe especially in Matthew, since Matthew has written so much to a Jewish audience. Yeah. Like, we're, I'm going to extreme effort to yeah. uh, parallel this man Jesus with your heroes. Your I, yeah. So yeah. I think it's safe ground to say that when, when Matthew writes, Jesus goes up on the mountain yeah. and sits down, that his original audience would go... Elijah, Moses, you know, the prophets of old, these people who communed with God on Mount, on high places yeah. and brought a word from God that was significant and central to the way that yeah. we're going to now live. It's no wonder that the early church then adopts this as kind of a constitution, mm -hmm. as a, you know, a livable, practical, central way that we're going to be together as the church yeah. is going to be found in these words. Yeah, I, I, let me ask you this question. Mm. My congregation knows I love to ask questions. So yeah. that we can kind of go this way. I'll ask questions and you fill in the blank because my <laughs> congregation will love to listen to you uh, <laughs> because they're tired of hearing me. Uh, but, but let me ask you this. Is it fair to say, or what do you think about mm. the idea that Jesus is being paralleled with Moses here? Mm. And so he goes up on the mount, mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. and what he gives us is a new law. Yeah. Do you like that language? Is that fair to say that he gave us a new law? Or is there other language we could use or yeah. should use? Well, it's certainly been interpreted that way. Uh, I guess I'd have to ask the question, of what do you think that means? What, do, what does law mean? I see, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... So I think I think that one thing you might be getting to <laughs> is the the whole idea that just in the same way that the Sermon on the Mount is the the word sermon is a word we have juxtaposed onto it mm -hmm. that the word law in and of itself is a word that we have put on what we commonly call the law yeah. that um that it can be a misleading word and the and and scripture itself doesn't necessarily call the law, the law. Would yep. that be fair? Yep. Am I right? I don't I, know. Am yeah. I, yeah, okay, good. I think so. I mean, when we think of law, mm -hmm. what what do we even think of? Yeah, and that's that's the problem. And maybe yeah. that's the point, is what comes to our imagination mm -hmm. when we hear a word. Because we might be getting off on the wrong foot the mm -hmm. minute we say law. Yeah. Because we think of legalism, we think of, of rules that yeah. we have to conform to. Yeah. The speed limit says 35, I have to drive 35. If I don't go 35, I am wrong. Right. I am. I deserve to be punished, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And I feel like maybe we miss, and maybe everybody misses, maybe culture in general just misses the idea that the real goal is for us to become um, people of character mm. and good people who would uh, look out for our neighbor as we drive, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the goal of a stop sign is to right, keep you from killing somebody else. It's not just uh, a set of rules. But, but, it's, but it's more than that. It's a, it's a statement about the value of human life mm -hmm. and, and neighborliness and looking out for yeah. others' needs ahead of your own. And, yeah. Mm. So when we call things laws, we tend to think of rules, yeah. and we tend to think of not trespassing rules or else we're, we, we get punished, yeah. or, or there are terrible consequences. Yeah. And I feel like that sets us up to approach not just Jesus' um, mm -hmm. Sermon on the Mount in the wrong spirit, but I feel like it sets us up to uh, approach, for example, Leviticus in a really wrong spirit. Yeah. And so we have, I just mentioned to you, we've been reading through the daily office in our noonday prayer. Yeah. And um, right now we're in Leviticus, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so as we've been reading through Leviticus and the law, mm -hmm. um, I've been struck, this is what I've been struck by, Rustin. I have been struck by how much of it I kind of like. I, I, uh, I, for, I, I don't know how old I was the first time I read through Leviticus. It was probably high school, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, because mm -hmm. back in those days I was trying to read the whole Bible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't do anything so foolish now. <laughs> um, but um, but um, going back to it at my age now, I was like, this is all really good. Uh -huh. I mean, some of it's strange. Some yeah. of it is very ancient. Like yeah. you, you can tell you're What's, reading something from another culture from ancient yeah. days. But What's different, though? I, I mean, how did you read it now that, uh, how did you read it then that felt constrictive that now feels? Uh, 
The, you know what? I don't know if I can honestly answer because mm-hmm. I don't know if I can remember. But yeah. I, 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 what my guess would be is that it was so ingrained in me that that was the Old Testament, and yeah. that it was you know it wasn't legalism and, mm-hmm. and yeah. That, that you just kind of read it. And I think probably as a high school kid reading through Leviticus, I thought, oh, this is funny. It's so strange, you know. Mm-hmm. Don't let any blood be in your meat, you know. How could that be relevant? Yeah. But now I'm looking at it and I'm going, well, not only do I like most of it, like, and it, and it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, it's a lot about treating each other well and treating yeah. foreigners well. And yeah. not only do I like it, but I think a lot of it is is the same stuff we see in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. Like, it's like, whoa, I think Jesus said this. Yeah. <laughs> there it is, you and, know? And Jesus comes to, in his own mission statement, to fulfill the law. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever we mean by law. Yeah. He's filling it to the full. He's saying all, all this stuff. He's not undoing it, but he's bringing it to its rich fullness. And so now, I think part of what's happening maybe in my own experience, which is similar to yours, that as I read now back through Leviticus through the lens of having spent so many years invested in the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, I see the heart of God in on full display in Jesus. I can see the beginnings of that in the law um, in Leviticus. Mm-hmm. And it's Jesus isn't really saying new things. He's just giving us a more clear picture of God's heart yeah. as he puts these things out. Yeah. And we'll get into it. As we get into the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus himself makes clear that what, what I'm trying to get at is your heart, you know. Mm. And, and, yeah. and, and, but, but, but I think what he would say is, is that what the, what the Old Testament, what Leviticus was trying to get at was your heart, too. That's you right. Just, you, you just kind of missed that. We missed it. We miss it. I mean, we still miss it today. I mean, we, 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 yeah, we just miss it. Yeah. But um, I even think that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, I didn't come to erase or to do away with any of the uh, the law, as you know it, you know. Um, and sure enough, it's like, hey, you didn't. This is, you yeah. Know. Yeah, which in a way, as Matthew puts this across, he has Jesus going up on a mountain and sitting down, mm-hmm. which is in a way saying to all those people who were deeply familiar with Moses as their hero, who also went up on a mountain to receive mm-hmm. the law, uh, he's setting Jesus up as being the fulfillment, uh, kind of a new Moses, mm-hmm. right? In their imagination, they're like, oh, Moses, let's pay attention. This pay is the attention. new law. Here's yeah. the new way to live. Yeah. And that's what Jesus is going to be for them. Here is the way to live. Here is, pay attention. This mm-hmm. is the new Moses. Here is the way to live. Mm-hmm. And then even though so much of the Sermon on the Mount reflects Leviticus, as we just got through saying, yeah. It still rocks their boat, I'm sure. Yeah. It's still just, and I think it's designed to knock their socks off. No right? doubt. Yeah. Jesus is being a provocative yeah. uh, teacher, a prophet. Yeah, which a good teacher would do. A good teacher says, well, you've had this with you all the time. Yeah. You just missed it. You know? mm-hmm. The good English teacher says, um, well, Great Expectations is not a new novel. And you may have read it a long time ago and were really bored with it, but you missed it. Or Shakespeare, you just missed it. I'm here to show you how awesome this is. That's right. And and it's going to knock your socks off. Oh, that's so good. That's true. Of all the great teachers I can think of, they Mm -hmm. they helped me see something that I might have missed or might have been bored by. They make it come alive for me. Come alive. Yeah. Which I think Jesus is doing with Leviticus here. Like So when Jesus is coming to say this this law is fulfilled in your hearing, mm-hmm. which is how he, he predicates this whole thing. Um, he's it's fulfilled it's filled to the full. All this all these stories you've heard, all this stuff that Moses tried to tell you, now I'm here to fill this up so that you to the brim, you're gonna get this finally. You're gonna, gonna get it. I'm gonna show you yeah. what all this meant. And it meant the same thing the whole time, but I'm yeah. gonna now show you. I love that. Yeah. And again as an English guy mm-hmm. and a literature guy is like that first moment that Shakespeare came alive for me. Right. Like, uh, holy crud, this is really <laughs> relevant. You know, this is great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, sorry. I just yeah. had to say that. So hey, Jesus as English teacher is going to make the law yeah. come to life for us, right? <laughs> That's right. The first thing he does to knock their socks off is to go into what is called the Beatitudes, which just gets them started with, a, oh, we're, we need to pay attention to this because this yeah. is really, it's, as we've been saying, it's yeah. not different, but it's different. It, in fact, Jesus is going to employ that language. Uh, you've heard mm-hmm. it was said. But I say. But I say. Yeah. So, yeah. Profound stuff there. But yeah. 
Let me ask you, Rustin. Hmm. Do we have time to ask the question, what are the Beatitudes? Can we do that? Let's save it because it's so good. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So next time we get together, I'm going to ask you the question, what <laughs> are the Beatitudes? Oh, I can't wait. And, um, and, but we set it up now so that... Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. That would be good. Good. Well, uh, Jesus goes up on a mountain and sits down, mm -hmm. right? So he's got our attention because Moses went up on a mountain and that turned out to be a pretty important event. And now Jesus is going up on a mountain. So Matthew's telling us something, that something big's going to happen here. And this is where we're going with this conversation, right? Yeah. The Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. I'm excited. I think if we do our job right, then the people watching or listening yeah. to this should go, oh, you know, this is coming alive to me in a way yeah. that it hasn't before. Yeah. As, yeah hopefully. Well, I, I hope that because I need it again to be alive to me. I me mean, too. This is, the, this is the rich center of who Jesus is and we need him. So let's do this. Let's end with a blessing okay. as we would do if we got to meet with our churches during this time. Yeah. This is one part I miss. Uh, one of the blessings I use at Vox on occasion is from Hebrews 13, and it goes like this. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though, as though you were in prison with them. Be content with what you have, and remember that God has promised, I will never leave or forsake you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Rustin. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah.